I, I made a custom sling actually for, for GSG in the UK a good long time ago. Now she didn't order it. I just wanted to make it because it was her favorite colors. And I took 16 hours alone just on the stitching for the sling. So that's kind of where the cost comes in. Um, I'm not a machine. I don't just, you know, place an order, go to sleep and wake up the next morning. And there it is. I sit on the floor in my living room, watching TV, making those things. You're listening to the Defro Airsoft Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Hefe Airsoft and Poppins Patches. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Defro Show. I'm your host, Stuart Rowe. Today, we are sitting down with Yannick, a.k.a. Dagger One Charlie. Thanks for joining us today, man. Thank you very much, Stuart. Uh, it's been really exciting to make this happen. Uh, I've been thinking about it for a while, so thank you very much for taking the time. Um, yeah, so let's get into it and see what we can get. Yeah. All right, man. So tell us about yourself. Who is Dagger One Charlie? Yeah, so Dagger One Charlie, when he's at home, he's Yannick Moser. He is a father to two children, getting married this year. And when I play Airsoft, I have been doing it since 2017. Like most of the people, I went to a game with a mate of mine um, because I played a lot of video games and thought this might be fun. And since then, it stuck. Um, I tried to get out as much as I can. Last couple of years, didn't get out as much. But I still, I love the industry. I love the, the community behind it. Um, I started off with my first pistol being a 1911 RWA um covert customs and i love it i still have it and it's my go-to gun and this is kind of where it snowballed from there and then about two two and a half years ago i started getting a little bit more involved into the making products for airsoft itself so i started off doing um paracord work mainly rifle things that kind of thing and about maybe a six seven months ago i decided to actually set up a separate instagram account for it Previously, everything was done through my Dagger One Charlie uh, Airsoft account. It's now created a handmade by Dagger One Charlie for just the, the the paracord itself. And yeah, that's kind of what I do on a weekend. When I have some time, I make things for people or I go into something plastic when I can. Nice. It's it's nice to meet a fellow creator, but I guess this is like a, a physical creator, so it's slightly different. Yeah. More blisters than anything else, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what are some of the most popular paracord accessories you offer for Airsoft games, and what sets them apart from others on the market? Yeah, so I mean, the most common one, as I just mentioned, is I make a lot of slings. I make single-point slings, I make two-point slings, I make adjustable slings, quick adjust slings. Um, I've also invented or created a thing called the Bang Dangler, which is quite specifically designed for the use of pyro grenades for people who like them, make it easier on the field for them. Um, what sets them apart from other slings out on the market? I mean, I suppose like everything else, there is a lot of people that do paracord work. There always will be. What I do just is, is I make them custom to what people want, uh, you know, colors, length, styles, that kind of thing. This is kind of where, where it sets it apart from Everybody can go into the shop and buy a two-point two sling made by Viper Tactical, for example. And that's just the sling that everybody has. And it does the job for a lot of people to get going, including myself. Um, but then the paracord just comes in to make it a bit more personalized. Nice. So it's it's really just that personalization that you can offer. You can get the colors you want, you can get the style you want, and you can have something that you know makes you unique on the field. Absolutely. You know, you like to run, um, you know, you like to run around in black and red. I can make a black and red sling to go along with it. It's easier to easier, easier to get done rather than trying to find a new line somewhere to have made. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. <laughs> okay, so can you walk us through the process of designing and creating a, a new paracord accessory? Yeah, so design, I mean, as I, the first thing I always check with people is a couple of basic questions. How long do they want it? What kind of clips do they want? Do they want to have the HK hooks or do they want the quick detach uh, rifle mounts or do they just want to have loops on the end that they can put onto anything? And then is it a single point, a two point, or what kind of color are they looking for? That's kind of in the design part. That's the first part to ask. Kind of what colors do they want? Where do they want to go from it? After that, it's figuring out how long it is. 
ordering the, the materials for it and get going. A lot of people, when they order, they just give me, you know, those basic measurements or those basic requirements and then let me have free reign to get going. Um, sometimes they can get a bit wild and they look fantastic. Other times they can be quite, you know, simple and basic, but just as much fun to make because at the end of the day, it's making something special for somebody that suits their play style. And that's kind of where where the design comes in. At times I see someone's rifle and I'll be like, well, look, I have, a, I have an idea and I run it past them or they say yes or no. Or sometimes I just tell them I have an idea and they're like, I don't want to know, just go for it. But those are, those are the special ones. So you just can go let loose and get creative. Nice. Tell me more about these uh, special slings. They uh, they sound interesting. What's your, uh, yeah, your so, craziest one? Yeah. So like a couple of months ago, I had a guy from Greece email me and say, look, I have a rifle. It's painted in gray and white and black. And I want to have a sling to match with it. So I had a look at the rifle and I basically ordered in the courts, figured out what st- which style he wanted. And I've recreated the pattern on the sling that he has on his rifle, which was kind of like the, you know, line, lines going down across in a gray highlight color across the, uh, across the rifle. And somewhere along the rifle, he had a number seven in there as well for his call sign. So what I actually did is at the end of this thing, I hand stitched the number seven into it with white paracord so that it would stick out. Um, so this is kind of the things that, that makes the the piece is very unique when somebody wants something like that. Nice. I like that. Having that extra touch of personalization in an accessory is nice. Yeah, I might need to get some done. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I think you have a black and gold and a little bit of red. Mark 18, is it? Um, yeah, I've I've got a ton of stuff. Um Gaza <laughs> one Gaza and Mayday both have uh, Mark 18s. Yeah, I've got some yeah, mine's just an abomination. It's just a, uh, an, it, it could be uh, a Mark 18 now if like the way like the handguard's been replaced. Cause it's a, it's a stock M4, but we, when I bought it, the handguard had been replaced with this big red handguard. So yeah, now that you mention it, it does have Mark 18 vibes. That's a good point. Yeah. I just love, uh, whipping that gun out on the field because there's something fun about just running around with a big red gun when you're in like full military outfit and then the gun just doesn't match. I find is hilarious. Absolutely. I mean, if you look at my Instagram account, you know, I have a white, red, and blue MP9. I run a P90 with uh, tiger stripes on it. I have a glow-in-the-dark sniper rifle. So most definitely my rifles are not designed to blend in. (laughs) Yeah, I've seen uh, all three of those guns. I I love the paint job that you did on the uh, the MP9. It, It looks fantastic. I think yeah. it actually popped up on the show once or twice when we we're doing the uh, uh, the game of uh, naming the different guns. So yeah, nice work. Yes, it, did you it paint did it yourself or you? I did. That? Yeah. What actually happened was is this: I found a pin when I was in Switzerland. I found a nine eleven pin from one of those old um, like like a fire brigade badge kind of thing, and I said, "Okay, I'll buy this." And then I came home and I said, "Okay, I'll make a sling with this." So I made a tribute sling to kind of the the first respond unit by tying it a red, white, and blue sling with a blue line and red line uh, sling weaved into it. Um, and then I had the sling and then I looked at my MP9 and I was like, oh, no, sure, I'll just go all out. I'll paint the MP9 white, got some blue, got some red, added in the stripes. And then uh, my fiance, who is very creative when it comes to writing, she did all the detail work in terms of drawing on the don't thread on me on one side and drawing on the uh, a little zebra bow on the bottom as a nomad to herself and her condition. So it kind of just rolled from that way. And, and this is exactly how my, my paracord works sometimes. I just spot something and then this in, entire explosion of creativity comes comes to life. And yeah, and, and then it just it stands out. Yeah, I, I really wish that uh, I was more creative too. So nice. Okay, so... Some people say that paracord accessories can seem more aesthetic than functional. How do you respond to this? Absolutely. I mean, yes, as you said, there's a lot of times where it can just be, it looks good. It gives people unique personalities. It gives them a way to express their own style. Um, But at the same time, they are designed to take heavy loads. I've made a sling for a guy down in Cork. He has a 
10 kilo MG42 and I've made a paracorp sling for that for him. So it is more than capable of taking the weight of any rifle in terms of the, of the quality and the build quality. Um, as I mentioned, I've created a small um, devices called the Bang Dangler. Uh, that actually came about was I watched one of Kicking Mustang's videos where he went to um, the, gang, uh, the Gang Wars, the Gang War Games in the UK. And he was tossing a lot of pyronades around. And he, every time he took one, I've noticed it took him quite a while to get the grenade out to be able to throw it. So I figured I can make something. And I came up with this device, which is about yay long, as uh, six metal clips on, on, on either side all together, um, giving you the, the chance of collecting maybe 12 to 14 pyro grenades onto it and you just put it on the side of your vest and rather than having to go fumbling around in your in your pouch for it you could just pull and throw um so there is a lot of uh, versatility to these products and they can make the game style easier um because again for i made a, i made rifle slings that have those grenade hooks attached to the front so for snipers that are lying somewhere down in the in the bush a uh, little movement as possible is best so i figured i'd make this so that they can put their grenades right onto the rifle and rather than having to take their hand off and move down into a pocket to try and grab a grenade and throw it they can just let go of their hand guard grab a grenade pull it and throw it without even having to take the pin out because everything is just connected so in that sense there is a bit of both there is you know functionality to it certainly and there is a lot of personality to it to suit people's play styles um some things that I have made did not work out. I've made a quick adjust sling for a guy in um, in Germany, and that was the first prototype that we that we tried. And it turned out the webbing was a little bit too thin, so every time he was adjusting it, it would wrap up in itself or fold over. So it didn't work out. But it was a prototype. He came back to me. I exchanged the webbing for something a bit wider, something a bit thicker. And now there is about 10 to 15 of, of those slings floating around the world. Um, here in Ireland, in Germany, there's a couple of gone over to the US as well. Um, so the product just gets improved as the feedback is given from players. As I said, I do play myself. I don't play as much as people. So as much feedback as I get, I try to incorporate and make them better as time goes on. Nice. It's all about feedback. The more feedback you can get from people, from clients, customers, friends, other players, you can just make such better stuff. You, you just really need the feedback. Exactly. You can't make it better if you don't know what doesn't work. Exactly. Were you able to like uh, reach out to Kicking Mustang and recommend your uh, bang dangler for him? He and I were working a, a good bit together. Um, but as you know, Kicking Mustang has always been in, in, in a bit of a, uh, you know, forefront for controversy at times um he was using it for a good long time but then unfortunately at one point i had a custom order for somebody else that didn't go down so well on on their end so this kind of professional relationship has stopped as such but there was no there, there is no hard feelings in between it just it is what it is and we went our separate ways but my aim at the time when i made the devices for him was to make his game style his play style easier and I fully believe it did that at the time, and I'm sure it still does. Whether he still uses the products or not, I don't know. Um, but yeah, when when he was using it, he was very happy with them. Nice. I'll make sure to look out for it in uh, some of his videos. And now for a commercial break. Are you looking for a company that puts the community first? Look no further than Hefe's Airsoft Solutions. The founding principle of Hefe's Airsoft Solutions is to offer a way for players of all types to get the greatest experience possible. Their passion is making a difference in local communities and serving each of their customers with the utmost respect. Become part of the conversation by joining hundreds of fellow airsofters in the Discord server. There, you can find out about upcoming events, sales, giveaways, and more. Join us today and start enjoying all that Hefe's Airsoft Solutions has to offer. Together, we can make a difference in our community. And for listeners of the podcast, Tap into the power of the code DEFRO10 and save 10% on your next purchase at hefeysairsoftsolutions.com. Some exclusions apply. The more you use the code, the more it helps the podcast. Okay, back to the podcast. So, 
Paracord accessories can be a little bit more expensive than regular slings and stuff like that. How do you justify the extra cost? Um, again, yes, absolutely. I can go to the shop and buy myself a functional sling for 10 euro and it does the job as it should. Is it me? Probably not. Do you want something custom to suit your loadout? You know, that's where the cost comes in. Um, a simple sling, you know, 80 centimeters, one color will probably take me, you know, half an hour, 40 minutes, maybe an hour to make. Uh, something more custom. I have spent slings for, I, I, I made a custom sling actually for, for GSG in the UK a good long time ago. Now she didn't order it. I just wanted to make it because it was her favorite colors. And I took 16 hours alone just on the stitching for the sling. So that's kind of where the cost comes in. Um, I'm not a machine. I don't just, you know, place an order, go to sleep and wake up the next morning. And there it is. I sit on the floor in my living room, watching TV, making those things. And that's kind of where the cost comes in. You know, yes, I can buy cord. Everybody can buy cord somewhere cheap and try to do it themselves. Absolutely go for it. Um, where others don't, and they come to me and ask me to do it for them. So that's kind of where the price the, the, the price difference comes in. Nice. That makes sense. If you want something custom made, it's going to take time. Yeah. As we mentioned, a custom doesn't come cheap, but you can have anything you want. I had a, an ex RAF guy looking for a sling that was using regimental colors and he wanted to have a Spartan shield in it. So I found him a custom Spartan shield bead that was included in, in the sling. I had another person that was looking for a sling that was connected to his history in the army in, in and around the uh, tank regiment. So I found old shell case beads to incorporate into it. And we made a sling and we made a matching bracelet for it. And that's kind of where the, the, the key factor as well comes in for pricing. If somebody is looking for something really custom, they can get it. I will find them a beat somewhere. I will find them a a brooch if they wanted to. I had a young gentleman actually two weeks ago sent me a bracelet that he wanted to be made with a um, material from a army beret cap that he wanted included, which has sentimental value to him. So this is kind of where the difference comes in that you want something custom, you can get it made. And that's kind of where the differentiation is in price. Nice, that definitely makes sense. For the beret, did they use the material, sorry, for the beret, did you use the material of the beret in the stitching or was that included in some other part? So the way he actually had it, he had a piece of fabric from the beret. I'd imagine thinking of it, it was probably the inside lining of the actual beret, which is just a black fabric. Um, he sent it on to me and there was a good, nice long string off it. So what I had actually done was is I made the bracelet itself in black and white so that the black lining would shine through the white paracord and, and weaved it in that way. Um, I'm due to post it out probably tomorrow, so he should have it next week and it will be online then on my account later on in the week. That's really cool. Making a custom accessory from a sentimental item of clothing. That's really cool. I've never heard of anyone offering this service before. Nice. Yeah, so the, the the real limitation is just of what people can imagine, you know. I mean, it's it, these kind of requests, I would say, are always, you know, in a way daunting a little bit because this is someone's personal belongings that they have a memory of and you want to do them proud. So that kind of gives it the challenge. But then if you don't try to make it, they will never have it to begin with, where if you can work out something and they're happy with it, that's kind of the key at the end to make sure that they get something that they never thought they could have and now they have it. Yeah, exactly. If you can offer a kind of service like that, that's that's amazing. I need to think like what what do I want like in a sling? What like piece of clothing should I destroy? You got, me, you got me thinking. With the increasing call for sustainable products, how do you ensure that your paracord materials and production methods align with eco-friendly practices? Yeah, so I mean, obviously, we all try to do our bits when it comes to the eco side of things. And um, personally, my power cord all comes from within Europe. So anything I order is within the European Union, so not too far away. I tend to go to my lo local shop down the road sometimes and pick up a roll here or there. Um, 
if I buy custom beads, depending on what they are, I try to source them within Europe as well, as far as probably, I would say, the Ukraine or, or Lithuania. That's kind of the, the furthest I've gone in that. All my tags are being ordered from a guy in Lithuania as well. So again, within Europe. The only thing that doesn't come from, from Europe as such tends to be, you know, cheaper kind of beats that you can get on AliExpress. But again, there, the eco-friendly side of things is I don't buy it as an express shipping. I'm not looking to have it within two days. You know, it gets here when it gets here um, in that sense. It's Anything, coming on a big ship. Yeah, exactly. It comes on a big ship in a container and then it'll be here, it'll be here, and then we get working. Any cord that gets left over at the end, I tend to reuse. Um, I had a gentleman order a sling off me a couple of days ago. I, I made the sling. I had a ton of cord left, so I just decided to make an extra bracelet to go along with it. He doesn't know about it. He'll find out when he gets it in the post. Um, <laughs> I tend to use the kind of the scrap bits to make little um, zip pullers. Again, make your life easier on the field. If you have a bag that has a small zip, you can pop that on. And, and, and make your life easier within the games or even just for your normal travel bag or your, your work bag. So I tend to try and use nearly all of the court that comes in. Very rarely do I throw anything out um, in that sense. So pretty much what gets sold gets used. Yeah. And that's my, my part on the eco side. And as I said, it's handmade. So there is no machines involved. Everything is, is hand knotted. Everything is hand stitched. So there is no electricity being used except, as I said, the telly running in the background while I watch the TV show, you know, when I sit on the floor for five hours straight making the thing. <laughs> All right. Some people say that paracord accessories are, are just a trend at the moment. Do you think paracord accessories are here to stay or is it something that's only going to be around for another six months? To be honest, I think it's something that's here to stay. Um, it's been a trend way before it came into airsoft or, you know, people always like to make their own things. Uh, when I started off doing the, the, the slings for, for my own rifles in airsoft, I actually got my tutorial videos from people that were doing their rifle straps for real steel guns, you know, for their hunting rifles. So in that sense, I don't really think it's a trend. Um, people will always want to be unique. They want to have their own kits. There is the, 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 the tier one operators you know, that want to have everything to the textbook or what it should be. And, you know, how did they look when it, when when, they, when the American soldiers were in Mogadishu or what was the Vietnamese style during that time? There will always be that level. But then you have the casual skirmish guy that just wants to go and have a good time. He runs around in a pair of shorts and a, and a Hawaiian shirt and figures, oh, sure, I may as well throw a sling along with it. So in that sense, I, I don't think it's a trend as such. It's just one of those, you know, each to their own. Um, I do notice at times there is an influx of people wanting to buy slings or depending on, on you know, if there was a festival on or if there was a big game on that there's a lot of people going to. Uh, but other than that, I, I wouldn't say it's something that, that happens today and is gone tomorrow. Yeah, I, yeah, I can uh, imagine you'd see like uh, a big influx of orders if like in uh, John, like if in uh, John Wick 5, you can see him rocking like a, special paracord sling or something like that, I'm sure your orders would skyrocket. So yeah, that's a good point. People are always people are always looking to reproduce uh, kits really authentically and will try to get everything down to the very last detail. So getting a, so getting the perfect sling is a, a big part of that. Absolutely. Okay. Collaboration can often lead to innovative products. Have you ever collaborated with any other businesses or individuals within the airsoft community to create new paracord accessories? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the number one, as I was mentioned before, is the Bang Dangler, where I work with Kicker Mustang on how to make his life easier. Um, but there's actually been quite a bit of collaboration between myself and a few other um, paracord creators. So there is the Crafted Court in the UK and the, the Crafted Hangman. Both of these guys, or girls and guys, I should say, were doing paracord at the time. Um, we we're quite close, or quite good, friendly, friendly competition as such. And at one time, they were doing a charity game in the UK, which was around uh, the suicide prevention for, for men and mental health in general. Uh, we came up with the idea that the three of us would make a sling together. So I knotted the sling. 
um, crafted cord, did the hand stitching on it after I sent it over to her. And then the crafty hangman afterwards made a bracelet to go along with it and match. So we did quite some unique pieces in that sense. And um, we worked together, we worked together quite a lot when crafted cord started off first. Um, we were talking quite a lot and helping, helping each other out to make certain things. And now it's come to the point where it's just ba- both on the same wavelength. Uh, I made a, a, a light up sling a good couple of, a good couple of months ago. She made one herself as well. So it's just kind of the, the, the ideas are bouncing off each other and vibing here and there. So there is a, there is a lot of that going on. And even though, as I said, because, even though we are technically speaking competition, I don't see it that way. You know, everybody has their own style and there is more than enough to go around for everybody. Nice. Yeah. Collaboration is key at the moment, especially with the, the bands on Instagram. The, the only way that you can get views now is by collaborating with other people. So I definitely think you have the, uh, the right idea for your business moving forward. Yeah, I think when it comes to Instagram and their rules, I think that's probably one of the main reasons why I set up my own personal paracord account because obviously previously on my airsoft account it would have all the toy guns, firearms and everything was blocked and nothing was getting out. So now this is why I set up the personal account for the other business account, I should say, for for my handmade by Dago One Charlie so I could make the slings and post the slings without the rifles in it. Um, and even then, sometimes the, 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 the content still gets flagged for maybe a wrong word in the description. So it's still a, it's still an, an ongoing or never ending battle of trying to get all right. Yeah, I'm exactly the same. I started another account for the, the podcast, which is just clips of talking heads of people talking about airsoft, no airsoft guns in any of the pictures. And still every single one gets flagged and I appeal it, I win it. I'm like, hey, I'm unblocked. And then the next day, oh, you've been flagged. Ah, damn it. And it's just, I don't care anymore. So I just stopped doing it. It's it's so hard to win with Instagram, but TikTok seems to be working quite well at the moment. So I'm putting more effort into TikTok because at least they're not banning me. Yeah, I've actually tried, like I, over the last couple of months, I've started to do in a bit more reels. I mean, there are still, you know, amateur looking as such, but... I've, I've started taking reels and showing people, you know, how I make my slings, you know, from the the 60 meters of pure paracord mess into trying to make it into the nuts and how long it takes to make a nut to what the finished product is at the end. I've, I've, I'm trying to do it a little bit more just to show people really how much work goes into it. So with that, I probably should probably pick up a TikTok account as well just to share those those short videos here and there. Um, to to get the exposure out there a little bit more, but at the same time, when when I started off my my paracord passion, I always said, you know, for me it's a hobby, it's a little side gig, it's not a full on business. If I make enough money at the end of the month to pay the road tax on my car, I'm happy. So, and that's kind of how it's working. Um, most likely, I do want to take my account a little bit further. I've I started making more and more items as well for kind of the the everyday carry um, community. So I, I you know, I have my own watch strap here made. I, I make lanyards for you know for for carrying your your keys or having your access badge for your for your office. Um, I might look at making some hangs as well. There is there is a sewing machine upstairs that's you know itching to get used. Um, but generally speaking, I always treat it as a hobby. I have a I have a day job that I have to do. And this is something on, on the site that I like doing to make to make special things for people who want it. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same. So I try to do uh, all the podcasts just on Monday. So I'll shoot a podcast during the week, which takes like an hour. And then I'll do all the editing on Monday night, which can be like 10 hours. And then I try to have all the other days of the week free where I'm where I'm not doing Instagram and stuff like that. Because if you're doing it every day, it just... It just stops being fun. But if you can have like a deadline and you're like, look, I'm going to get everything done by 2 a.m. And if it's not, then it's just, that's it. That's what goes out. And I find doing that, it keeps everything in check. Otherwise, I'll just keep adding more stuff and adding more stuff and editing more stuff. And then nothing ever gets finished. And yeah, trying to get like one podcast out a week is, uh, it's hard. 
Uh, getting an audio podcast out every week, like unedited, sure, that would be fine. But just all the the fine editing in the video, and then when someone talks about a clip, you need to put that clip in, and when someone like mentions a product, you have to then find that product, then who owns the product, so you can put the correct licensing in. Yeah, it's it's so much work. <laughs> you wonder what you do to yourself. <laughs> I've I also wonder the same thing. <laughs> he talks a little bit about using Paracord to make everyday carry items. Um, are there any other plans to expand your product range beyond general Paracord accessories for airsoft guns? Yeah, I mean, I make a lot of other small bits and pieces. I said I, I make stuff for key rings, simple stuff to, to keep your keys handy on your belt. I make in dog leads. I have two little dogs myself. They both have their own dog leads. Uh, there's a good few family members. They have their own. They have their dog leads, dog colors, um, and like I said, I may be looking at possibly doing some hangs further down the line. Um, I had a guy in the Netherlands ask me to make him a monkey fist, so there is that as well. So it's, Wait, it's are, always... aren't they illegal? They know they're illegal in America. Yeah, I think there's a lot of stuff that's that, that's per se, you know, illegal, but at the same time. We still have them, you know. I mean, I'm I'm Swiss. I've grown up with a pocket knife in my pocket. Technically speaking, here in Ireland, you're not allowed to carry a, a, a any anything with you because you're not. It is just what it is. But I've grown up with it, so there is at least on my key ring, there's just tiny little Swiss Army knife. You know, it's just it's it's some things you just you, you just get used to. You know, it's just that. Yeah, I don't yeah. Know. In Australia, it was the same. So, like in Scouts and stuff like that, we we could carry like a a very small pocket knife that wasn't over like a certain length. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure if that law is still like in effect now. I, I I feel like that's probably changed now because I I don't see really anyone walk, walking around with a little pocket knife anymore. Yeah, I think I think it's just cultural. It it, it does come back to come down to culture. Like I said, I mean we'd we'd go out on a family day out to go for a picnic somewhere, and I'd have a pocket knife in my bag to cut the bread. At the same time, you know, I better have is oh, you can't do it. So you can't. You, you know, you're not able to. Why? We're out, we're out camping. We're out, we're out on a on a picnic. It's, you know what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to, you know, just use my hands and break it up and make a mess of it, or not? So I just, I think a lot of the stuff is just cultural. Yeah, I know. Like in Japan, like you can't walk around with a knife. Uh, but if you're camping, then of course, you know, you can have like a hunting knife or something like that because you need something to prepare the food with. So I think you're allowed to like carry anything that's reasonable. So like if you're a chef, you can carry your chef's knives. But you can't carry the knife like in front of you while you are on the train. Like that's that's frowned upon. Yeah, I'd imagine so. <laughs> yeah, that actually happened recently. Like there's a great video on YouTube about it where like this chef was like super overworked and he just like finished like a twenty hour shift or something like that. So he still had his knife with him and he gets onto like the crowded train and he's just holding the knife and He's just so tired. He doesn't realize what's happening. And then everyone in the train screams. They're running off the train. I'm like, what's happening? And like, this poor chef, he's like, oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> this going to be an awkward one to explain to it. Is, I'm in trouble. <laughs> I remember watching that. I watched the video like three times. So it's only like 50 seconds. And you're like, wait, why is everyone running? Why is everyone screaming? What? What? The chef? Ah, oh, he's in trouble. And yeah. Yeah, it's it's a great video. I'll see if I can send you the link to it later. <laughs> <laughs> and now for a quick commercial break. Introducing Poppins Patches. Express yourself like never before with their wide range of patches. From political statements to two-way culture, pop culture icons to prehistoric dinosaurs, they've got it all. And if they don't have it, they can make it. Since they also do custom patches. Want a patch for your team? Or have a cool idea for a patch? Hit them up. I guarantee you'll be impressed with the results. And don't forget, they're iconic, tactical Tricon hats. Not only do these hats provide shade and make you stand out from the crowd, they also have Velcro so you can add a patch. Visit poppinspatches.com today and use code ABOLISHATF to get 15% off everything in the store. Okay, back to the podcast. All right, uh, next question. With the rise of technology and 3D printing, how do you see the future of paracord accessories evolving in the airsoft industry? Yeah, so in that sense, um, 
I don't think there is much of a connection between the 3D printing directly to the paracord. I think they'll always be somewhat separate as such. Having said that, I have cooked up some brain ideas already of mine, which involved a friend of mine making me 3D prints that I can incorporate in some of the slings. So what I have been working on is I've, I've, I've managed to get my hands on a Bifrost tracer. I, yeah, very got nice. the, I got the guy to print me off a 3D insert about this size to drop into the tracer and I had him drill holes into it on certain points that line up with the LEDs inside the print uh, inside the, the Bifrost unit. The next part then is I made my own sling and I bought myself about 50 meters worth of, uh, you know, fiber optic cable and I plaited the fiber optic cable into, into one and wove it into my sling. So the idea is, is that when you shoot your rifle, the Bifrost lights up and in turn, the Bifrost will light up the fiber optic that goes around the sling. So there is a little correlation here and there, but I, I do think it's two separate industries, two separate hobbies. I mean, the 3D printing guys make insane stuff, but in terms of, of, of mixing it with paracord, I'd say it's very minimal. Yeah, no one's going to be printing their own slings anytime soon. No, I wouldn't say so. I mean, we, we have very mobile dragons printed upstairs from, from a guy here in Ireland, but I don't think they would do too well when they get hit with PBs. So, yeah. Yeah, that's what I've noticed. Like all of my 3D printed stuff, as soon as it gets shot like once or twice in a game, it's it's just destroyed. So, yeah, I, I need to get stronger stuff. All right, let's go on to my favorite part of the podcast now, controversial opinions. I'm going to give you some controversial opinions I found on Reddit. I want to hear what you have to say. Number one, Tokimorui is overrated and overpriced. Absolutely. You know, I mean... I have so many myself. I shoot my G18C a couple of times and all of a sudden it flicks from full auto to manual and won't go back because a screw came loose somewhere. I do think it can be overrated, overpriced a little bit and is probably overrated in some sections. Real steel optics are a complete waste of money. A 100%. I do not want a 600 euro sight shot out by a BB just because I wanted to have the real steel. We're shooting projectiles that may go 100 feet at best you know after that do we really need something that can kill something from over two miles away no we do not nice that was a really good one high rps builds for airsoft are dumb i already can't hit anything on full auto so if it's even higher rate of fire i'll probably just lose more bbs so i probably would say stick to semi-automatic or, or burst that's my opinion on that <laughs> Most airsofters need to spend less on gear and more on gym membership. Oh, no, no, because spending all the money on gear will get you your free gym membership because you're going to be silly enough to put it all on game day and run around with 20 pounds hanging off you for 45 minutes every game. No, you don't need gym membership just to just to go play airsoft. Yeah, that's what I do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. You just sit on a chair. <laughs> airsoft is 90% roleplay, 10% sport. No, no, no. Airsoft is 100% sport and 70% crack in between. Yes. <laughs> Most of the gear on your plate carrier is useless. Absolutely. I have no idea how much stuff I have on my plate carrier. What do I actually use? Probably the mags out of it and that's it. Full auto should be used more. Absolutely. You know, why have a gun that shoots full auto and then not use it just because you're indoors? Sorry, what? You know, we're playing soldiers. We want to have fun. And you're telling me I'm inside and I can't shoot full auto? I can only shoot semi out of the windows? I can only shoot full auto into the window? No, just shoot whichever way you like. Nice. That's that's one's going to go viral. I like that one. <laughs> How many times... Should you shoot someone? Until they scream, ow, so you know that they took the hit. That's fair. Yay or nay on knife kills? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you've managed to go across the entire field to sneak up somebody behind and get them with a knife, you should definitely do it. Yes. Should kids be allowed to play airsoft? 
under adult supervision, absolutely. I do think that it's uh, yeah, there's certain age, yes, certain protection that needs to be worn, but I do think they should be allowed to to a certain extent. It's it's something to to have fun with. Multicam is boring. <laughs> Everything I have is multicam mixed in with something else, so it probably is a little boring, but it just goes with everything. What can you say? Stock guns are fine. You don't need upgrades. Absolutely. Don't fix it until it's broken. I had my guns. I up got them upgraded professionally, and then two weeks later, they broke anyway. I mean, as well, just play with what you have. You don't need a lipo battery. I probably do. You probably don't. My batteries run out, run, run out halfway through the game anyway. So, I, you know, what you can run, you can run. You don't have it or don't. Flagging isn't a big deal. I would say when it comes to safety, everything is a big deal. Uh, you never know which way you might hit somebody, especially if they're up front and close. So the last thing you want to be responsible is taking for somebody's eye out. So I would say always be, be aware of your surroundings one way or the other. Hmm. When is mag dumping acceptable? When they don't call their hits. Fair. <laughs> All right. I think we have some good content there. I'll uh, I'll cut this up into some uh, different Instagram videos, and then uh, I'll throw this up on YouTube. So yeah, thanks for the answers. All right, Yannick. So thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Uh, this brings us to the end of the podcast. So let's do some shout outs. Think of friends, uh, teammates, sponsors, anyone you like. Shout them out. The mic is yours. That's Absolutely, sure. Thank you very much for the time. It has been fun. It has been exciting. And it was exactly what I hoped it would be. Um, as part of shout outs, I would have to say absolutely a shout out to all my ambassadors. So we have Honey Butcher in the US. We have uh, Ruby the Great in the US. We have the the Cerberus Airsoft team in the UK. And we have Brower Airsoft in, in the UK as well. Absolute huge shout outs to these guys. And the latest one to join was... PSDC Airsoft, the two dolphins running around at NAF. They are part of my ambassador team. So a huge shout out, shout out to all these guys. Um, I get along great with them and they are just such nice people. Uh, they really helped me so much throughout. And again, I want to give a shout out to GSG Sniper Girl. She has been with me pretty much from the start. When I started doing my things two years ago, three years ago at this stage, she did an interview when, when I first cooked this up. So again, a huge thank you to her as well as Fox Green Airsoft. He has been one of my main supporters throughout from the very start, helping me along. And uh, just a big thank you to anybody who has so far purchased off me. It really is appreciated. And a huge thank you to people who will come back to me at some point to order something new. So thank you very much for all your support. I do this as a hobby, but my key part really is it's just to give people something unique that you can enjoy in the field. Thank you very much. Thanks. Nice. Good. I, I know half of those people. So nice. Good good uh, list of ambassadors. I'll make sure to include your links in the description so listeners of the uh, the podcast can uh, pick themselves up uh, a nice link. Brilliant. Thank you. All right, man. So thank you very much for joining us for the, uh, the podcast today. Uh, hopefully, I'll be able to see you on the field one day and uh, shoot you. That'd be fantastic. I mean, Japan is on the list of places to visit, so it could well be a possibility. This episode is brought to you by Hefe Airsoft and Poppins Patches.